So in this video, we're going to talk about a slightly different form of mechanical oscillator, and that's the pendulum. So what I've got here is what in physics we call a simple pendulum. So that consists of a length of string that is suspended from the top, and at the bottom we have a small mass that we call the bob, and we're going to treat that mathematically as a point mass. In fact, this is a very good approximation when you've got a small mass like this on the end. Now, the difference between a pendulum such as this and the mass spring system that we've been dealing with before is that with the mass spring system, the displacement was linear. If I displace this pendulum bob, though, I'm displacing it to the side, and what results is an angular displacement as this bob rotates around the equilibrium position at the bottom. And that's going to make our application of Newton's second law to solve this system slightly different. So let's take a look at that. This is our pendulum, and here we have the uh, string which has a length L, and then at the end we have what we call our bob, um, and this has a mass M. And so for a simple pendulum, we treat this as a point mass on the end of the string. Now, when we did the mass spring system, the first thing we did was apply Newton's second law, and we said that force was equal to mass times acceleration. Now, here, what we've got is we, instead of a linear displacement, we've got this angular displacement from equilibrium. Here's where the string hangs vertically. That's the equilibrium position. And here we've got a displacement through an angle theta. So instead of using the linear form of Newton's second law, we need to use the rotational form of Newton's laws. And so what we have is we have that the moment of force acting on the system is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration, which we write theta double dot, or you may have also seen written uh, with the symbol alpha. But this is the angular acceleration. And remember, the dot notation means that we're differentiating with respect to time. So this is d2 theta by dt squared. So if I uh, write out now so the f uh, this in terms of the quantities we've got here, first thing I need to do is to calculate the moment of the force acting on the system. Or if you're an engineer, they use the language torque. Um, so to calculate that, the only f external force acting on the system is the weight here. And so what I need to do is to take the moment of this weight about the pivot point um, what I need to do is I need to resolve this into two components. And I've got the component uh, parallel to the string and the component perpendicular to the spring. So the parallel component here acts through the pivot point. Remember, here is the uh, pivot at the top. And so therefore, this component has got a zero moment. Right? There's no moment for this point, for this component. However, this component here, of course, has got the lever arm that's equal to the length of the string. And so this one is going to have a moment. And so the f magnitude of this force is the component of the weight. Well, if I close the angle, I use cosine. Here I'm opening the angle. So it's mg sine theta. So that's the magnitude of the force multiplied by L. Now, the other thing we need to remember when we're doing moments is we need to define a direction that's positive. Well, since here are the equilibrium position, this is where we define zero, and we've moved through to this angle here, then this direction is going to be uh, positive, and this direction is anti-clockwise. So this direction here, uh, anti-clockwise, is going to be positive. And so um, if anti-clockwise is positive, if we look at the moment of this force, well, this force is generating a clockwise moment. It's trying to make the mass move in this direction, and that would be a clockwise direction. And so therefore, this moment here is negative, because it's a clockwise moment and we're taking anti-clockwise as uh, positive. So this now is equal to the moment of inertia. Well, the moment of inertia of a point mass is just the value of the mass, so that's m, multiplied by its distance from the pivot point squared. So this is m times l squared, and then theta double dot. 
Now, if I look at this, we can start to cancel. There's an M on both sides, so that can go. And then I can cancel one of the L's here with this L here. And rearranging and writing it out in full, I get d2 theta by dt squared is going to be equal to minus, um, and now I've got g over L times sine theta. So, this is our differential equation, and this is clearly a problem, because what we want is that we want the second order differential of theta with respect to time is equal to the sine of theta. This is a nightmare of an equation to solve. In fact, it's, it's even mathematicians have trouble uh, solving this level of equation. It's, it's incredibly hard uh, uh, to come up with uh, solutions to this. So. We're physicists, though, not mathematicians, so what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a solution that's useful for most of the situations in which we deal with a pendulum. So to do that, let's have a look at a diagram here. And what I'm drawing is I'm drawing a triangle, and I'm going to put a little right angle here, and I'm going to put it in the center of a circle. So this here is supposed to be a, a circle. Right? I know it's not, not well drawn. Now, if I look at this, then the length of this line is r, and the length of this line is r. And the length of this arc, so the arc, and we'll call this s, this has a length of r times theta, where theta is this angle in the middle here. Now, how do we know that? Well, the definition of theta in radians is the arc length divided by the radius. That's literally the definition of um, an angle in radians. And this is why, of course, that there are two pi radians in a full revolution, because the circumference of a circle is two pi times r. And then if you take that angle and divide it, that arc length, and divide it by r, then you end up with an angle that's two pi uh, radians. It also explains why an angle is a dimensionless quantity, because it's the ratio of two lengths, this length divided by this length. So that's our arc length. What about this quantity here, this length here? So this is the right angle triangle from this point dropping straight down onto the other radius such that this line forms a right angle. Well, if I look at this angle, let's call th this length here, well, let's call this d. Well, by definition, the sine of this angle theta is the opposite, that's this length, divided by the hypotenuse, which is r. That's d over r. So this means that the length d is just r sine theta. OK, all well and good. But supposing now I look at the case where theta goes towards 0. Now, as theta gets smaller and smaller and smaller, this point here is going to move. Th this intersection here is going to get longer and longer. And so these, this vertical line here is going to become roughly equal to the arc length here. So as theta goes to 0, s will become roughly equal to d. Right? Certainly in the limit of theta becoming 0, d will actually equal s. I mean, they'll both be 0, so not a useful case to consider. But what we're considering here is the case as theta goes towards 0, so as theta becomes small. So s is going to be approximately equal to d. So what that means is that r times theta is going to be approximately equal to r times sine theta. And so if I cancel the r's, I get that theta is approximately equal to sine theta, where theta in radians. Right. So here we're doing everything in, in radians. So this is what is, is the approximate value for sine theta for small values of theta. So for small values of theta, sine theta is roughly equal to theta. So now let's come back to our pendulum. And what we're going to do is we're going to do what's called the small amplitude approximation. So what we're going to assume is that our uh, pendulum is not going to be given a large amplitude. And so what this means is that theta will be small because we're only going to be going up to small displacements from equilibrium. And what this means is that sine theta is approximately equal to theta. So if we put that into here, now we have d2 theta by dt squared is equal to minus g over l 
times theta. Now this looks a lot nicer. If we compare what we had for the um, mass spring system, that was d2x by dt squared was equal to minus, and then we had k over m times x. So you can see that this is solvable, and this is going to give us simple harmonic motion. Now, just like we could use this value here to extract the angular frequency for the system, so we can extract the angular frequency straight from this equation here, and we're going to have that the angular frequency of the pendulum is the square root of g over l, and since the period is equal to 2 pi divided by omega, we're going to get the period of the pendulum is 2 pi times the square root of l over G. And so this is our formula for the period of a simple pendulum. So here's the formula for the period of a pendulum that we just derived. Now one of the most striking things about this period is that the t here, the period, is independent of the mass of the bob. And so the period of the pendulum depends entirely on this length L and, of course, on the strength of the gravitational field G, um, but it does not depend on the mass of the bob here at the bottom. And this is one of the things that make a pendulum useful for telling time because it's easy to adjust the length uh, to make sure that you have uniform length for a pendulum. It's a lot harder to adjust a mass, um, and so it doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about adjusting the mass. You can have wildly different masses, and it makes no difference to the period. Now, we can use this period to calculate a frequency. Frequency, of course, is just 1 over the period, and so this is 1 over 2 pi times the square root of g over L, and so here you can see that the frequency increases with the gravitational field and decreases with the length of the pendulum. Now, it's important to note that this result is only for small amplitude vibrations of the pendulum. If you have a large amplitude vibration, um, then this formula does not apply. You do not have simple harmonic motion, and you'll end up getting discrepancies. Um, in particular, you'll find that the period, um, unlike all other simple harmonic motion, the period will start to depend on the amplitude. Um, and so it becomes um, you know, very difficult to uh, uh, calculate because you've also now got to use the sine theta form instead of the theta form. So for a pendulum, we have this additional caveat that we did not have for the mass spring system, that we only can use this simple harmonic motion um, when we have a small amplitude. So we have this caveat only for small amplitudes, and we have a prediction that the period is independent of the mass. So let's check that out and, and see whether we've got our predictions correct. Okay, so what we saw from the maths was that the period of a pendulum is independent of the mass of the bob on the end of the pendulum. So what we've got here are two pendulums of equal length, but one has got a small mass and the other here has got a large mass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set these uh, oscillating together by pushing them into the middle. And what you should see is that for a small amplitude vibration, these two uh, pendulums remain in sync. So here goes. So you can see they keep coming together in the middle at the same time, and so therefore the periods of both of these two pendulums are is exactly the same, despite the fact that this pendulum here has got a far larger mass on the end than the smaller pendulum uh, over here. So clearly the period of a pendulum is independent of the mass on the end of the string. So we've just seen how the mass on the end of the pendulum, the mass of the pendulum bob, does not affect the period of the pendulum. What we're going to do now, though, is if you remember when we were doing the maths, we made this approximation and we got simple harmonic motion, but the approximation we made was that we only had a small amplitude of vibration uh, uh, for the pendulum. 
So what I'm going to show you now is for these two pendula that we've established have exactly the same period, I'm going to show you what happens if I give this large mass a large amplitude oscillation and I keep the small mass oscillating with a small amplitude. And what you'll see is that the simple harmonic motion approximation does not work for this large mass and they will start to get out of sync in their motion. So here goes. So remember I set them off by coming together in the middle and you can already see now that this one is arriving a little bit earlier than the large mass because we've given this large mass the large amplitude vibration and so the large mass is not undergoing pure simple harmonic motion anymore. It's still oscillating but it's no longer a simple harmonic uh, oscillator. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is, as we saw from the maths, one of the things that the period of a pendulum does depend on is the length of the pendulum. So this is the distance from the center of the bob, which we're assuming is a point mass, all the way up to the pivot point here. So what we've got here is we've got two pendulums, one with four times the length of the other. So this length here is four times the length of this pendulum over here. So what the maths tells us is since it depends on the square root of the length that the period of this pendulum should be twice the period of that pendulum because the square root of 4 is 2 so this should have a period twice as long. So let's see if that's the case. So I'll bring them together here and so what you'd expect is that this pendulum will do two oscillations for every single oscillation of this pendulum. And as you can see, that's exactly what's happening. They're coming together in the middle, but in between those meetings, this shorter pendulum is doing two oscillations, whereas this pendulum just does a single oscillation. So now we've seen that a simple pendulum like this undergoes simple harmonic motion, providing that we have a small amplitude. But this type of pendulum is not the only sort of pendulum that we deal with in physics. Supposing instead of a simple point mass on the end of a string, we had a rigid object and pivoted that about a point. Clearly that object would swing backwards and forwards, but then we no longer have a simple pendulum, we have what we call a compound pendulum. So let's have a look at the motion of a compound pendulum. Now we've seen the simple pendulum. This is a slightly different but related beast and it's called the compound pendulum. So the difference with a uh, compound pendulum is that we now have a uh, rigid body of some description instead of a point mass and it is pivoted about a single point here and L now is the distance between the pivot to the center of mass. So it's not necessarily the length uh, of the pendulum. It's the distance between the pivot point to the center of mass. Now, to solve this, we're going to use exactly the same technique that we used for the simple pendulum. We're going to use exactly the same approach. We're going to use Newton's second law, but we're going to use the rotational form of Newton's second law and we're going to define this anti-clockwise direction as positive. So this direction here is going to be positive. So once again what we've got is we've got that the moment is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. This is just what we had for the simple pendulum and we're going to calculate it exactly the same way because the um, moment acting on it, remember we center of mass for a uniform gravitational field is equal to the center of gravity. So um, we've got the two things at the same point here um, as long as g is constant. Um, so the center of mass equal to the center of gravity for a constant uh, gravitational field. And so the moment of the weight about the pivot, since the weight acts at this point, acts at the center of gravity, we're going to have the same thing we had for the um, simple pendulum, only L now is a slightly different interpretation. It's this pivot uh, distance between the pivot to the center of mass. So we have minus mgl sine 
theta, right? So this is the perpendicular component here is mg sine theta, multiplying it by this length L. And this is going to be equal to the moment of inertia. And since we've no idea what this object is, we leave it as I. We don't break it down. To be able to break it down, we have to know exactly what the moment of inertia is. And then we multiply it by the angular acceleration uh, uh, theta double dot. So writing this out, we have d2 theta by dt squared is equal to minus mgl over i times sine theta. Now, we can't simplify this any further without knowing what the moment of inertia is. And to do that, we have to know what shape this rigid uh, object has got. Um, so we're going to stay with the general case, and we're not going to worry about this. We're now going to do the uh, uh, small theta approximation. So this is the small amplitude, so small amplitude uh, vibrations. And what this will give us is that d2 theta by dt squared oops, is equal to minus mgl over i times theta, because for small values of theta, sine theta is roughly equal to uh, theta. So from this, we can now calculate the, uh, we just read off, in fact, the angular frequency. So omega here is the square root of mgl over i. And so this means that the period is just 2 pi divided by omega. So this is 2 pi times the square root of i over mgl. And so this is the period for a compound pendulum. Now, to be able to actually calculate the period for one of these pendulum, you have to know what the moment of inertia is. And to calculate that, you have to know what the shape of the object is. And what we're going to see um, in a minute is how this period varies as you alter this pivot point. Now, one of the interesting things with this is as we alter the pivot point, you change the moment of inertia and you change this total length here. So to see how that works for a compound pendulum, let's do a quick experiment. So here we have a compound pendulum. So you can see that this is different from the simple pendulum. We've now got a solid object, consists of a long, narrow piece of wood here with a large piece of wood on the bottom to give it a bit of weight at the end. And I've got it pivoted about a point here right at the top, but there's holes so I can move this pivot point closer to the center of mass of the pendulum, um, and we'll do that in a minute. So I'll set this oscillating, and just as we predicted, you end up, for low amplitude oscillations, you end up with uh, a simple harmonic motion. So the question is now, is what happens when I move this pivot point closer to the center of mass? Now, in a simple pendulum, when I shorten the length of the pendulum, which is equivalent to doing this, then the period of the pendulum decreases. We end up with a faster, higher frequency oscillation. So what is going to happen to the compound pendulum when I try that? Well, let's see. So what I'm going to do now is hook it up higher. So your top has now gone off the screen, but it's, uh, it's still attached. And you can see that this is not the same as a simple pendulum. The frequency has, in fact, now decreased. We have a longer period. And the reason for that is that the pivot point is closer to the center of mass. So the force of gravity has a smaller moment about the pivot point. Because remember, the center of mass or the center of gravity is where we can consider the weight of the pendulum acting. So I now have a small moment, so a small restoring torque or small restoring moment, and that generates a lower frequency oscillation. Now, what I've also done by moving the pivot point close to the center of mass is I have actually decreased the moment of inertia. But unlike a simple pendulum where all the mass is at the end of the string, when I halve the length of the string, I halve the torque due to gravity, and I 
quarter the moment of inertia. And so that moment of inertia has reduced by a factor of four. It overwhelms the fact that the moment due to the weight has decreased by a factor of two, and so you end up with a shorter period. With a compound pendulum in this shape, when I sh move the pivot point close to the center of mass, I've only slightly reduced the moment of inertia, nothing like as extreme as I have for the simple pendulum. And so what wins is the fact that I've reduced the torque uh, or the moment due to the weight of the pendulum. And so what that means is that I end up with a lower frequency of motion, as you've seen here. So it's counterintuitive. It goes the opposite way for this particular shape to a simple pendulum. So when it comes to compound pendula, it's not going to be an easy uh, to know whether moving the axis is going to generate a longer or shorter period, you have to do the calculation and figure it out for yourself. So now we've studied both simple and compound pendulums, and we've seen that both of them undergo simple harmonic oscillation, but only for small amplitude vibrations. Unlike the mass spring system, we do have to make sure that we're not undergoing large amplitude oscillations. The other thing we have to be careful with is with the compound pendulum is when you shift the pivot point, the response of the pendulum is not well defined because you've increased or decreased the moment of inertia and you've also altered the distance from the center of mass. And so for a compound pendulum, care has to be taken if you change the pivot point. Now, this is about as far as we're going to go with perfect harmonic oscillators. But most of the harmonic oscillators we deal with in everyday life, including this pendulum here, are not perfect harmonic oscillators. If I left this pendulum long enough, you would see that the amplitude of the vibration slowly decreased away to zero due to friction forces on air resistance. So in the next video, what we're going to talk about are damped harmonic oscillators where a force opposes the motion of the mass.